Welcome back to Pastor Plex Podcast. So excited that all of you are here joining us to talk faith, culture, and everything in between. And once again in studio, I have Mrs. Leah Brown. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. Yeah, pumped for Leah. She has been uh, a part of the ministry I've been in for about... Oh, gosh, 2009? 13 years. So many moons. Leah has been there uh, through the thick and thin, and she did wreck a van in Southern (laughs) California, and I did get upset at her in 2009. I didn't wreck the van. I was backing out of an alley. I had to fold my mirrors in because it was a really tight alley right by USC, (laughs) and I had some spotters who were watching to make sure I didn't hit anything. Those spotters led me astray. They did lead you astray. Why I generally just don't trust people. And then. (laughs) So can you talk about how we got that van fixed? All I know is that (laughs) as soon as I told you, you almost beat the crap out of me in a ranger and (laughs) a raging anger fit. I I was. No. no, Was it a rental? It was a rental. And here's what I said at the rental. Let's not get insurance. What a rip off that is. Even though we're going to be having an 18-year-old girl drive a van full of Which other 18-year-old, 18-year-old girls. girls. No, I was around. having uh, Holland drive it, but he may have not been of age either. Well, actually, the reason I was driving it was because, now this is definitely a story we're telling. We went to California, Los Angeles, to do prison ministry. Yeah. We got there. It turns out none of the women were allowed to go into the women's prison to do prison ministry. Why? Why For was some that? reason, we had been put on some sort of a blacklist from a previous experience at prison oh, ministry. Oh was that the one in Louisiana? Where somebody, I don't know who <laughs> Oh my god. Oh, that was when she was handing out smokes to people. Okay, what happened was <laughs> in Louisiana? Yeah, it was in Louisiana. And then it transferred all the way to California. Yeah. I got blacklisted we brought, at the prison. We brought a non believer, a question uh, uh, she was seeking. We brought her with to prison ministry because what better way to be confident that you want to be a believer than watching all of these on fire college kids go share the gospel with mm-hmm. prison inmates? I mean, it really did. It worked for a lot of people. I don't really know if it worked for this girl. I don't but. think it did work. We brought her with, well, she she was a smoker and she was in the prison for too long. She, she was like, I need a cigarette. And you can't really get out. Once you're in, you're in until they let you out, which for some people <laughs> is a long, long time. Um, oh, man, and so there are she, better judgment calls in my life. <laughs> you weren't there. I take full responsibility. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. I said to her, I said, Well, I bet if you just pay one of these inmates, they'll give you a cigarette. I was like, give her a dollar and she'll give you a cigarette. Easy. And that's what she did. (laughs) She got her cigarette. She went out into the yard and smoked it. (sighs) And uh, we got put on a blacklist. So then in California, we were on this blacklist. We didn't know it. Women couldn't go into the prisons. And so all the women were left on the outside with the van on Malibu Beach, struggling alone. And all the men were in prison sharing the gospel. And that's how the van got um, scratched. Scratched. I scratched the van. There was a small scratch on the van that was about two feet long. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And you know what? This is, I've said it before publicly. I've been Team Adrian for a long time. And uh, Adrian called me down for you. Before most people were Team Adrian. And it might be partially because. She she backed you up on that. She did. I was like, Leah, what in the world? I'm pretty sure she grabbed your hands, put them behind your back, and said, Don't you lay a hand on that innocent (laughs) college girl. (laughs) you i was not i was never going to hurt you i just want to make that clear i was a little bit fired up uh but then okay so what happened holland then went to the shadiest part of la (laughs) he paid like 400 bucks cash cash. to under the table like fix the scratch so the rental company didn't know because that would have been pretty bad we didn't have the money we were doing ministry on nothing yeah that was glorious days those were the good old days Huh. <laughs> I think that's Holland and Jenny's relationship budded that's where it and blossomed they, there. Yeah, they went back and forth picking people up from the airport. Adrian almost ditched you because she saw what an angry person you were. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh my gosh. All right. That's a joke, everyone. No, I'm just man. teasing. I'm just teasing. <laughs> yeah, all right. Uh, but that wasn't incredible. Where were we going with all that? I was. We were just, uh, that was, were, you were talking about near death experiences of hell, actually, and I, that's mine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Well, welcome to the show once again, uh, Mrs. Leah Brown. It's nice and <laughs> also welcome to the show, the one and only Pastor Joseph Aiken III. Welcome. I have 
I have no story <laughs> like that with Chris yet. <laughs> not yet. Not yet. All right. So the question, the question that is on our hearts this morning is, uh, what about NDEs going to hell? So near death experience, people who die and then go experience hell. Do we have a count of those? In fact, I got asked this question twice. Uh, on the same day within minutes of each other. So this is something that people are really interested in. Now, uh, this is going to help your skepticism because um, you would think that, you know, if more people are going to heaven, people would get their act together or sorry, if less people are going to go to heaven because, they're you know, the road to hell is paved with good intentions and it's really broad and the road to life is really narrow, there'd be way more hellish near-death experiences than there are. But only 23% of near-death experiences are hellish in nature. But there are hellish um, uh, near-death experiences. And uh, this is a preview for this Sunday. I'll be talking about hell on Mother's Day, which for some of you, uh, <laughs> Leah, uh, the, your your mothering experience may not be the most heavenly one. Yeah. It's pretty good until you get to about 3 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> it gets pretty dark around that time. <laughs> I had a mother tell me. I was like, "Yeah, we're talking about hell this week," and she was like, "Huh? Thanks, Mother's Day." <laughs> <laughs> so, in honor of all the hell that mothers go through, yeah. we're going to talk about hell on Mother's Day, and so we can really appreciate our mothers who what they go through. Fair? Yeah, I like it. Do you have uh, graphics for that yet? Uh, I'd love to can see. Can you work on that for us? <laughs> all right. The, the next question, which I thought was an interesting one, uh, it's this: Why do I feel guilty? I'm speechless. I mean, that's so no, very, no. Listen, it's what are some vague. reasons people feel guilty? What do you think? I mean, why? Why would people? I mean, that's all. The, that's there's zero context here. Why do I feel guilty? Now it's within the sermon series of talking about you know near death experiences in, in the afterlife. But why does this person feel guilty? Can what you, do you think? Can you give context for what you preached about? Because I feel like it was something you it said was last just, week. It was near death experiences, um, and so maybe it was uh, around the context of. Um, oh, maybe people getting more out, getting burnt out, uh, operating in the flesh. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I don't know what 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 would be what would bring on guilt. I, I think usually sometimes people feel guilty, and and it's actually a positive thing for them to feel that because that means their conscience is working, and mm-hmm. there's it's the Holy Spirit driving them to Jesus. Yeah. Um, but it could be that they actually um. Usually that's conviction and you, something needs to change in your life. Well, I think the clinical definition of guilt has something to do with you feel guilt when you've done something wrong, Ooh. which is kind of different from shame. A lot of times they're confused. Shame is when you feel like you are something yeah, wrong, so like something is wrong I with love that. you. So the definition is responsible for a reprehensible act, culpable. Yeah. Um, so that would be you feel culpable for an action which you – probably are which is why we all need jesus now talk to us about what's the difference between that and shame shame is i my therapist tells me (laughs) it's when you feel like something is wrong with you like you feel like you are wrong as a person so guilt is for the action shame is for the person Mm -hmm. okay it's a sense of identity Mm -hmm. okay that yeah and i so i i feel like what i would love to tell that person there might be some you know that you know, whenever it rains, I'd love to say this one. You know, it's raining because God's crying. Probably because oh something my you've gosh. done. Oh, my gosh. One of my favorites. Uh, <laughs> That's but, how you shame spiral people. Yeah. <laughs> but. <laughs> but I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I don't believe that. But what happens is because we, we know the rain falls on the just and the unjust. So, so it's not because God's crying. and It's because of something you've done. I think that was like a Jack Handy quote uh, from Saturday Night Live from back in the day. Anyway. is this Maybe this is a person who feels guilty about something that they've done. They feel like they've confessed it to God, maybe even to other people, but mm-hmm. they still have that sense of guilt. Right. And which is why it's so important to confess to others. So we, we've said this. Um, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not us. That's First John one eight, followed by First John one nine. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us all of our sins and to cleanse us from unrighteousness. So you can have that freedom. However, you can still not be healed and still have a sense of guilt when you're around other people because their actions of righteousness make you feel guilty. And so, therefore, we you know confess your sins one to another and pray for each other that you may be healed. So healing comes when there's a confession to people and a prayer of the gospel over that person. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Do you feel guilty about things after you've confessed them to God and people? No. No, you feel free. I do. It's so great. I, how about you? 
You know, I my dad loves to listen to this podcast, so he'll get a <laughs> chuckle. <laughs> he doesn't live anywhere near here, right? <laughs> but he's a he's a fan, a tenured fan. Uh, and he would get a chuckle out of me saying that as a kid, I would walk around the house professing to both my parents, I don't feel guilt about anything. <laughs> no, I don't feel guilt. I just and, don't feel it. Yeah. Um, Were you lying to yourself? <laughs> <laughs> I think we've confirmed, I'm not, well, we've confirmed I'm not a psychopath, so don't anyone worry about that. Yes. I've got lots of feelings. Good. Yeah. They, oh. They're just pent up. Joseph's they're, not sure. They're just in a big bottle that we keep stuff all the way down no, there. No, no. I'm very good at sharing them Oh, that's now. good. I've, I've come a long way. You have come a long way. I have. There was a time when you were not so good at them. Well, those times come and go, but... Um, yeah, no, I've, I've felt guilty, but I really do. I have confidence in God's forgiveness. And like, if he, if he's one of the greatest gifts he gives us other than salvation is the ability to live free and to believe what he says about his forgiveness of our sins. So I'm like, he says that I've been washed white. I can believe him. And and that doesn't mean I'm perfect. I'm still, I still fall. I'm still short. I still come short, but, but I can believe him that when God looks at me, he sees me through the blood of Jesus and loves me that way so i can walk in freedom because of that no i don't i don't really walk around with a sense of guilt when i teach speak that truth to myself that's good what about you joseph no i'm like you yeah i i I guess i could feel i could i'd like the potential no i I do feel guilty or when someone brings something up to me that i've done wrong i'm like ah you feel bad yeah and then but then once i go through the process of asking for forgiveness and talk it out i feel great so I do believe there's healing when you confess to one another. Yeah, I feel that for sure. That brings me back to, I'm sorry to deviate again. No, no, deviate. Uh, the questions about Catholicism that came up in your... <laughs> Man, we're, this is like, we're reaching way back. Well, because it's interesting. Um, you know, Catholics take these sacraments and they mm-hmm. make them, uh, in a lot of Dispensations times, means of grace, of grace mm-hmm. right? Uh, but they're taking really good things and oh, they're yeah. putting them into practice in a way that a lot of times I think the Protestant church misses. Like Absolutely. we're pretty big on confession to people right. here. Um, but it, it's I, a new thing for whenever I tell other churches about the like, you guys do what? Right. I think um, we've been scared of the idea of mm-hmm. confession because, because of it, it is Catholic. You're like, oh. Yeah, but it really is healing and oh. scripture says it's healing. And as long as you know that you're doing, you're confessing to God and you're confessing to other people because that's like the way God tells us to in mm-hmm. scripture and that it's healing, not because you think that the priest is going to For give you, you some have, sort have of grace. Special, yeah. 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 So I don't know. I feel like they get a bad rap a lot of no, times. No, I, listen, there's a lot of Catholic things that are awesome. And I love taking communion in a Catholic church. Cause the one thing, okay, the thing that's kind of neat about this, now I'm getting into church architecture. You know, the, the way that the church was structured back in the early days is that the whole church was built around um, a, the Lord's table. Mm-hmm. For many years, it was like all about coming forward, kneeling at the altar and receiving the Eucharist. Okay. And then, um, then it was all about over time, it shifted to Bible preaching. And so the, the pulpit was not then in the center. Uh, and now it's comes to more of a stage performance and now it's an experience that we're all trying to have. And so now we got rid of the, the pulpit or it's, it's at least it's mobile and so it's no longer the, the center. It's now wh- whoever's on the stage is the center to have the greatest experience. And you can even say like back in the early, early church, you had a baptismal was the uh, the center of the experience because you were just identifying people with Christ all the time. And so you can kind of look at as as church has shifted of the priority of, of experience of God's word of the Eucharist or communion, Lord's Supper. Uh, you can see kind of like the shift of what um, matters. And so confession of sin, you don't take communion until you had your sins forgiven. And mm-hmm. so if your only means of doing that was through a priest, then it becomes a big deal to make sure that you can receive your dispensation of grace, uh, at communion. So you get your dispensation of grace at confession. So you get your dispensation of grace to get all the sacraments. Mm-hmm. Down. Anyway, I, I know that's probably way more than anyone wanted to hear, but it is kind of interesting how with the, with the way that church has sort of shifted, um, now, we get grace is experienced through personal salvation. Um, and so you, you miss out on the corporate experience, which is why the stage becomes so important, but there's something really beautiful for our church, which I, I want to emphasize is the corporate confession of sin, uh, one to another. Anyway, that's probably way more than that was a rabbit trail. Let's come back. All right, let's get to the next question. Can you explain specifically what it would mean when the Bible says cast to Satan? Now I, I, Honestly, I'm having a hard time finding cast to Satan because I think I, at first I thought they meant like 
Satan cast out of heaven, but cast to Satan. I'm looking, trying to find that Bible verse. Yeah, I couldn't find it either. So the only thing that I could find is, um, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And this is dealing with, you know, it's actually reported that there's sexual immorality exists among you, the kind of immorality that's not even permitted among the Gentiles. So that someone is cohabitating with his father's wife. In other words, <laughs> sleeping with his father's wife. Um, and what they tell this guy to do is hand, cast this man to Satan or hand this man over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. And so what that means is excommunicate the person until he repents and so that Without this is why membership is important, and, and I don't know if we probably we probably never emphasize this em- enough, but I'm now going to emphasize it now. <clears throat> One of the things that we don't emphasize is that there's a covering that the church provides members because the elders sort of and and the church leadership pray for. Uh, there is a unity within the body of Christ. When you're ever identified publicly with a church body, then there's spiritual protection from Satan and his schemes. And so to cast a person out is to say that you are no longer under the protection of the church, and so Satan, have your way with this guy. Um, that's what that means. So I, if that's what the question was asking, Maybe. that's what that means. And so that could mean, what some people mean is that, oh, does that mean Satan could kill the person? Maybe. I mean, it is possible. Whenever you take communion wrongly some people had even died because of that i was very scared of that as a child <laughs> <laughs> and that's good you should be there should be a fear of the lord that comes along yes. with okay there, okay let's talk about that i feel like the people don't have a, a proper fear of the lord have, have you ever experienced a fear of the lord i just yes uh, i was terrified yeah so tell me like what kind of terror i was like if i take this communion and i I I believed that I was saved. I mean, mm-hmm. from a very young age. But I was like, gosh, what if what if my parents didn't tell me something? Like, I've only read half the Bible. Like, I've not finished it yet. Like, what if they miss something and I'm I'm missing a key part of my salvation and I haven't gotten to it yet and I'm about to take communion? What if? I, shoot, my parents are, love this podcast. Now they're gonna hear this. <laughs> <laughs> it's like so. Like every time you went, it's like Russian roulette. I'm going here. I go. I was like, communion. I think it could be over. I think it's okay. I think that they told me, you know, by grace, through faith. I think, but I'm, I'm going to take this communion. I was like, God, please don't smite me, Lord. I mean, I was six, okay? You know, young enough. I mean, hey, that's listen, young. I, appreci- I, I still know people that in every prayer they pray, they say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. And I'm not sure if that means they're like getting ready to go take communion somewhere and they don't want to, you know, they want to be caught up and they just want to do a coverall. You know, I also hadn't been baptized yet at this time, and I had friends that would tell me, Church of Christ friends, that I had to be in yeah. order to be oh. saved. So there were just a lot of things, a lot of conflicting messages coming yeah, from the Adrian culture. Yeah, Adrian grew up that way. Yeah. I mm. didn't grow up that way. I just grew up around those people. Got it. Um, what about fear of God? Did you ever have a fear of the Lord? Do I have a yeah. fear of the Lord? Uh, and maybe that's... Uh, yes. A real fear? Like yeah. A, yes. yeah like, appropriate fear of the yeah, Lord? Maybe appropriate. Like, did you ever feel like, like I don't want to take communion because what if I die? No, sick. it wasn't that extreme uh, for me personally uh, with communion. But uh, I, mean, I think I have a healthy fear. Like I understand that I mean, we all sin, we fall short. So I don't want to. I like, well, this is a license to sin and do what I mm-hmm. want. I was, I've always been scared. You know, growing up, there were things like, oh, I can't do what they're doing. Mm-hmm. You know, because God's gonna give me because I know better. Yeah. yeah, there was that aspect. Not, not just with communion. Because I, I mean, I grew up around people that were drinking and smoking, like teenagers, where it's like you're in the back of the school and right. I'm hanging out with these guys. Like, hey, you want to hit this? No, I, I just pass it over to the next person, kind of thing. And so, but I was always, I, I feared like that going. Yeah for many reasons but i feared god and that's just like i can't do that that's a big sin like i can't sin like that you know yeah yeah was your fear because you didn't want to dishonor god like you wanted to follow his law or was it he's gonna punish me uh i think it was a little bit of both i was scared of the repercussions of of like this may be that sin that god gets me on Mm. that mess up because this is like the the big one but then also i want to i mean i love god it's like hey i should be able to do better like it was just saying like i gotta be able to do man i had man talk about fear of the lord stuff so i was doing some sinful things uh and <laughs> back in the day and you uh, smile when you say yeah. that <laughs> <laughs> and then i would have these crazy dreams of like getting in trouble and like then it would happen it would be it was creepy no wonder you believe this imagine heaven stuff yeah, so I, deeply i know <laughs> wow. I, I, I didn't realize i had this many uh <laughs> 
like God experience. I guess I do. I do have those hmm. kind of on the regular. I didn't really, I didn't, I don't think about them that much until like I'm, pro- I'm like probing my mind. Well, actually I went on this retreat. Okay. Now I'm in a different subject, but I went on this retreat last week. That was like a getaway with the Lord uh, to examine your calling. And so I went back and I put together all the times that God like spoke to me in different ways. It was like, cre- it was like almost scary. And I just never had done that. Never strung it all together to see, even to the place where we got donated the land for our building, uh, it all connects. You know, it was like, it was really encouraging in one sense, like, oh, I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be and I don't need to fear anything. But sort of crazy, like God would use me and that must mean I'm responsible for something and mm. I hope I don't screw it up. Uh, and But then that was confident. The other confidence was that it was like, I can't screw it up. I just need to do what God's called me to do and not try and um, manipulate anything because that would be my normal tactic like you got to go and talk to that person and make that thing happen as opposed to now i'm just like i'm just gonna walk in the Mm. the strength and the favor of the lord and just trust that whatever happens is going to happen it's going to be good because he hasn't brought me this far and made all these things happen to you know drop drop me off a cliff i I think that's huge for you no it's really good Uh, because uh early on i i think one of our i think uh, phil said this pastor phil back in the day and he probably was kidding but like it really struck me He's like, you know, Chris, maybe our church is just an example of like when you try hard and then, but it's not enough and how God's sovereign so and it's all going to fail. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, maybe you're right. <laughs> isn't there, isn't there reason to believe in scripture that kind of when, when push comes to shove or when we all get to the end, when you get, when you finish running yeah. the race, God will kind of make sense of some of the things yeah, for that sure. happen throughout your life. And I feel like on earth sometimes you get little glimpses of that yeah. like he makes things make sense like this is why i worked how i worked that out for the good of those who love me and glorif- to glorify myself yeah, for sure whether it's a good thing and or that's bad what thing. so this retreat i got to put all that together and that was like mind-blowing and encouraging and crying and sweet and awesome you know like emotions uh it was <laughs> <laughs> uh, leah's eye roll is great on that. it's kidding. like lame emotions okay. no no so leah do you cry do you cry leah i do i i do cry mm-hmm. like what what prompts i think crying is a healthy thing it's a it biological response that helps you oh really, so. really stress so get some good hormones release what makes me cry yeah if you don't what mind. doesn't make you cry maybe that's a better question at this point i, I want to know what makes you cry yeah. chris might want to know what though when was the last time you cried? How about that? Last night. <laughs> <laughs> um, the last time I cried was my um, my grandfather passed away a couple months ago, and I really oh. wanted to go see him before he died. He, I was really close to him. He's a believer. He's he he kind of instilled in me my love of golf. Oh. And um, he was he passed a couple days before Christmas. And I was very pregnant and I I tried so hard to get to go go down to see him, but I was in just so much pain physically from the pregnancy. It was very hard pregnancy and I couldn't go see him. And then I was taking my kid on the Polar Express for a little Christmas treat. You know, this is 10 days before I had my baby, by the way. (laughs) And, uh, I got the call that he had passed and I was, I was happy for him because I knew he was really ready to go see Jesus. And he said it all the time. And he was only... He's only 76, guys. Like he's not he was not an old person. My my family's very young. My side of the family's very yeah, young. Like my mom us. is 74. Yeah, I know. So um it was just sad. I was me, like, I'm, man, I'm I wanted also to go old see him. To your dad, so I guess that makes sense. Yeah. Dang it. <laughs> you, did you say you're almost as old as my dad? I'm almost I'm almost old enough for your dad, so that makes a total sense. Well, anyway. you're you're like 6 years younger than my dad maybe. Oh, really? <laughs> So you're old enough. <laughs> yeah. And so I, I, it made me cry because I, I wanted him to meet my kids. I wanted to play yeah. golf with him one last time. Aw. Yeah. I'm going, actually, I'm going to go see my grandma in like two weeks. Oh, and that's good. I'm going to go play golf on his uh, golf course. Aw, beautiful. And I cry thinking about that. Well, thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Thank that, you for indulging. Yeah. That <laughs> was wasn't what you were looking for. Yeah. Oh, I was just like, and then my baby was screaming. I just lost my mind. That's what Chris was, like, was looking for. Yeah, that's what I was saying. I was like, I, I just can't do this anymore. Maybe that's just our house. Uh, <laughs> um, man, I was saying something that was like, where was I? I was NDE. Oh, the dreams. Oh, when do I fear God? So yeah, like the fear of the Lord has come, came over me in that situation where like, you know, God was like warning me and I was like, oh, and then I actually watched that happened and then like when i'm 
uh, fear of the Lord came over me with giving, which I know it seems like a weird thing. Like if I don't fulfill what in my heart, in my head, God's told me to give, I'm like sort of terrified about it because I don't want to miss out on the blessing mm -hmm. that uh, he has for me. And um, so I, I like think about it a lot. I'm like, am I giving what I should be giving? Anyway, mm -hmm. so that's a that's a random thing that kind of brings us back. Oh man, let me let me go on one more. Yeah, tangent. go do it. Oh, I should have answered this way. Actually, I lied. The last time I cried was not that day. It was ten days later. Okay. When I was giving birth to my son. <laughs> let me tell you, <laughs> I did not get that epidural in time. No. <laughs> <laughs> I actually thought I could be Superwoman. I said I didn't want it, and then we got to the very. It was the last. Push? Like 15 minutes. No, the pushing was the easy part. The, it was like the leading up to the pushing, like the five minutes before the pushing. Uh -huh. Got real rough. I was sobbing. If you want like a lot of hits on this on YouTube, yeah. I could play the audio I would recording love for you, you of me. Like, I would love Somebody, it. Somebody, y'all just recorded the audio? I want to hear it right now. Do you have it? <laughs> Are you dead? You're yes. serious? My husband recorded me <laughs> sobbing. <laughs> He was laughing. Having a baby. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, this this might go back to Genesis three where you're finally living up oh to the epidural God. took away uh the, the the what the Lord had for you. Uh and so Yeah. I mean it was uh to remember to the woman he said, I will greatly increase your labor pains and uh when with pain you will give birth to children. So the epidural kind of trying to reverse the curse there we're not gonna let that happen so you got the full expression of it yeah well i don't i do and i don't recommend it honestly all right here we go all right this is leah being vulnerable <laughs> nobody can ever say i'm intimidating or non-vulnerable again that's right you're, you're about to you share that it with, with your the... giving birth here we go all right oh gosh this is like almost nervous i'm fine I was fine for a long time. Okay. <laughs> I was weeping and sobbing. Like, was I was that full was tears good. crying. Hey, listen, you get full credit for that. That was completely Thanks. vulnerable. Thank you for sharing. Why did Why did he record you? Did he just say <laughs> I would have put that on video and be like, hey, everybody? <laughs> he recorded. Oh, I think I don't. He must have just been thinking like that one day. She, she'd want to know. She'd want to know. She'd want to hear herself. He's like, man, I've never seen her like this before. Oh, yeah, this is sense. good. I got to <laughs> capture it. All right, I'm no. gonna head, sorry, I don't want to cut you off, but we're gonna get to the next question. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> how is it you could be saved right before you die? I don't understand that. This is a great. Leah, when you hear that question, what do you think this per why why would a person ask like that? And it sounds to me like this person may not know Jesus. Well, if you know that Jesus said salvation is by grace through faith alone, not by any works that you could do. Mm -hmm. I know I, I paraphrase that verse, but then it makes sense because right. all you have to do is believe. You don't have to do anything other than I think the thief on believe the cross, and accept. Right? Yes, mm -hmm. the thief on the cross is a good example. We saw it happen in scripture. And also, you know, Jesus gives us that uh, that parable of the workers in the vineyard. Nice. Where That's a good one. like he the guy was mad because he'd been working for so long and then he got paid the same like what one denarii mm -hmm. denarius mm -hmm. denarii as the people that had just been hired. And he's like, This isn't fair, but right. it's like it's not my money. It's if it, your salvation is not about you, right. it's about God. It's about Jesus. And That's so, if good. it's really not about you, then it doesn't matter at what point, how long, how late in the game you get saved, because it's it's God's grace. Yeah, what do you he think can save you whenever He wants. Yeah, what do you think about that, Pastor Joseph? Uh, when she, she stole, it? she stole my scripture. Yeah, you know, that, that was the one. I was always <laughs> stealing stuff. You know, no, that was good. I I agree with what she said. Like it's. It's by grace, and so it's, there's nothing I could do. She's everything she said. I, I agree with. There's nothing I can do. God, God can save. I mean, to me, that's something we should celebrate. Not, not look at. I, I, it could be like a sense of like it's not fair, right? Yeah. Like, I think what a person's like. I've been living my yeah. life for you, Jesus. Kind of to the parable you pointed to. Uh, I've been living my life for you, Jesus, all my all my life, and now somebody just got to live however they wanted. And what you, I think what people miss out on, if you have that sort of mentality about life on earth, I've been serving you. You're doing it wrong. Yeah, like you should be experiencing heaven here, 
and then in the hereafter. And we've talked about this, but I think that's the struggle. We need to experience heaven here. And because, and the only re reason why people may not be attracted to who Jesus is in heaven and eternity is because they're looking at you, the misery of your life. If that is what Jesus is about, I'm out because I don't want any part of that darkness because I thought you guys had hope, but it sounds like you guys are more miserable than I am. And so I feel like that's what can happen at times with people. Um, and so if, if this is a Christian saying that, I, I would challenge you <clears throat> and your salvation just a little bit. I would check your heart. And it's like, what a, what a <laughs> cheesy statement. But I would ch to see if you're really in the faith. I would, I would go, it, was there a moment when you transferred your trust from what you can do to what Jesus has done? And if you don't have that, if your trust doesn't go from my life and how I'm working for God to what Jesus worked out for God on the cross and bought my salvation uh, and paid the penalty for sin, that he imputed his righteousness to me and I gave him, I imputed my darkness and sin onto Jesus. Mm -hmm. He who knew no sin became sin on our behalf that we might be the righteousness of God. Until that understanding wraps, wraps hold of your heart, you will... Um, live in anguish and pain. So I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for that question. And I really want to challenge that person asking it to really, has there been a time where you have received Jesus as your savior? And if not, what is preventing you right now from trusting Jesus as your savior? And if there's nothing, then text us and we'll, I would love to walk you through a uh, plan of salvation. Just you can text us 737-231-0605. <laughs> Find that number in the show notes. All right. Um, Next question is uh, also, also, what is your take on a church standpoint about gays? <laughs> I love the way that the person wrote that. Like, I don't know, that's, it was a unique way of writing that. Do you not invite them? Do you try and force them to not be gay? Like someone I know has a 13-year-old daughter and struggles with her identity. What do you do as a parent? I think you should start with the end of that question. Okay, so and you both have older children, so yeah. you should answer. Yeah, Joseph, what what would like if someone you know has mm -hmm. a thirteen year old daughter? So let's say you have a thirteen year old daughter and struggles with her identity, whether it's a trans identity or a lesbian or a um, gay person identity. What would you do as a parent? Well, what I do as a parent, I mean, I don't know. I'm not in that situation, but pray. You know, everybody wants to hear that answer. Pray. No, I, I've walked. I mean, we. Constantly, I would hope that my continue constantly praying and leading my son, daughter through the word of God and how our identity is in God. That, like I can't change what they're feeling on God could or what they're going through. And so this would have to be the word of God. This has to be their relationship with God and them understanding their identity is in God, not in uh, their sexuality. And, and so that's, of course, where I would start. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I don't I don't know more. To yeah. So. <laughs> Uh, as one who, you should check out the book. It's called Is Love Wrong? Uh, <laughs> so I'll publish that one. Uh, it's a little, the vulgarities are pretty strong, which might be why people didn't uh, okay. publish it. Well, but it could have been just, it wasn't written that well. But the whole point was, is that in Is Love Wrong, where I evangelize a gay activist, is um, what happens is I think sometimes we tend to separate, or we don't, we don't separate the sin from the sinner. So uh, what I did with uh, my gay friend, I said, do you trust Jesus that he died on the cross for your sins, rose from the dead? And that was a yes. Okay, I believe that Jesus rose from the dead. All right. Then I went to what is sin? What sin did he save you from? And that exploration was helpful. <clears throat> now, if you are saved um, by grace, but there is sin that you will not repent of, then that's a different story. And so he uh, couldn't be a member of any... Bible believing church because he was living out a gay lifestyle. Now, what I found out later, like for, just before he died, he told me that, but he wouldn't, he didn't tell me this till just before he died. So we went through years of debating this, but he wouldn't have intimacy with his partner after he became a Christian because he said he didn't want to offend the Holy Spirit. And I'm like, this would have been a different conversation for like four years if you had told me hmm. that. Anyway, but to, to that point, I, I would start with like, um, I, with children especially, I would say don't because you can kind of like don't claim Christianity until you're ready um, to follow Him. That, that's what I'd say for children because I think sometimes children make all sorts of professions of faith and they're not t truly identifying with Jesus. I, I'd hold off on the baptism at least until they know what it means to follow Jesus. So this is where parenting and then adult life is a little bit different um, because they're still growing. They're still 
trying to figure out what all, what all things mean. But I would really lay out what a plan of salvation is. And if, if sexuality is a part of the struggle, I'd say like, whenever you become a Christian, you're saying yes to Jesus, my Lord. He is covering all your sin. But sin, part of the sin he is covering is your same-sex attraction is your desire to live outside the design that he has made. Mm. And so whether you were born that way or not born that way, that doesn't even, I don't even, that doesn't even factor into the conversation. Will you live out the standard that God has put into his word? Some were made eunuchs uh, for the glory of God uh, because they were like, I don't, I want to be a eunuch. I don't want sex to come in between me and God, my lust of the flesh. So I'll become a eunuch to do that for the Lord. And some people, um, we're just born that way. So there's a reality where you can be born that way as a eunuch and still serve God however God calls you, but your sexuality always comes under the authority of God's word. And I think that's what's really challenging. So as a, if someone is parenting their 13-year-old daughter, I would say present Christ. Um, and if they reject Jesus, then I would say as long as you're in my house, oh, we're not going to um, live in a way that does honor God. But I love you, I care for you, and um, I'm not, whenever you um, get married or whatever, I wouldn't, like, if they're not a Christian and they want to come to your house with their partner, man, that gets a little bit challenging. But I would say they're not, why would I expect a follower of Christ to not live um, as a Christian? It's what all non-Christians do. So without the power of the Holy Spirit, you don't have the ability to live the Christian life. Now, there you can have some standards in your home because it's your home to uh, say, hey, I, I don't, I prefer that you wouldn't, um, sleep over in the same bed, but I would have totally invite them into your house. I would totally invite them in to have relationship with you uh, as a non-believer who you're praying for and asking God to intervene in. I think what happens a lot of times, we're wanting to put a Christian standard of life on a non-believing person, and it's impossible for them to do. And so while that might be the standard that you're living under, you're, you're, what you want to do is evangelize the world, show that the hope that you have and the ability for you to live out your Christian faith is genuine and real. And as Jesus showed us with the Good Samaritan, you can go cross cultural, cross religion to love someone, show hospitality. And I think we just need to understand that. I think that's a really hard question, but especially the one about if this was your kid, what mm -hmm. would you do? Mm -hmm. um, I think you kind of have to ask yourself, you answered it well, but some things that I was thinking about, yeah. like what are your goals as a parent? And I know that one of my goals, one of my primary goals is to character train mm. my kids mm -hmm. and to show them what's best for them and what, and how God's word lines out what's best for them. Yeah. And so that's kind of how I think I would approach it is like, I want what's best for you. And God doesn't just give us rules, a list of do's and don'ts. His word gives us, this is how you live the most fulfilling, fruitful life. And mm -hmm. this is my, my order and my law for that. Mm -hmm. And so I would really try to instill that into them. Yeah. Yeah. So going backwards, do you try and force them to not be gay? Again, uh, you're allowed to have standards as a, as a um, I guess as a parent, I guess, but if you're talking about yeah, so as a per, I don't try and force someone not to be gay. I think that's a, a weird way to to put that. I mean, what do you want to put a gun to your head? Like, don't do it. You know, I, that's that forcing seems a little strange. I, I do feel like I would challenge a person, um, but I, I'm not going to challenge them in an unloving way because I, I I don't withhold relationship unless they're a professing member of the church where they have. Now you're talking as a pastor. Yeah, now I'm a pastor. But as yeah, thank you. But you generally people are not like that those are two non coexisting things. So that gives me the freedom to love them really well and say, Hey, I, I love you. I want you to know Jesus and I get it. Um, life is crazy and you feel a certain way about your life, but God's design is perfect. Mm -hmm. And so, although you may not feel perfect, the way that you are is a reflection of the result of sin. Um, and that's part of the darkness. I have my own sin struggles that I'm dealing with and I have to constantly repent of them. And that's, that's life. I, I know that that seems a little harsh, but when you have friendship with people, genuine friendship, and you're able to love them beyond seeing their sinful outerness, then it allows you to have deep relationship. And as I had in the book that I wrote, which was actually a real relationship, I had genuine love and genuine care for, for my buddy, Don, who uh, passed away to cancer. Um, even though he had, uh, HIV positive as well. It was a sort of bizarre thing. Anyway, uh, that was a powerful moment for me. What were you going to say? You were going to jump on that. I was going to say that's a lot of like as a pastor. Now, yeah. what about as like a church though? Doesn't it, the question start oh, out by saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, how do we feel as a church? Yeah, yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that's a great point. Okay, so as a church, 
um, like you couldn't, you, you can be gay and lesbian or trans or whatever and show up to a Sunday service. We'd love to have you because our hope is you would hear the gospel preached and you would then be cut to the heart transformed darkness would flee you'd see the light of who jesus is and then you would accept christ and then we would want to walk with you through the process of understanding what that means but you are welcome here now one of the things we're going to ask you to repent of is the same sex not the attraction but the acting out of i guess that would probably be too but the acting out of a gay lifestyle we'd say no to that um but we would really love to fellowship with you, love you, invite you to parties, hang out with us. I'd love to meet your partner. Um, I'm not afraid of that. Uh, right. Just know that I believe differently and um, you're welcome to believe differently. But w- when you claim Jesus, you, you're claiming him as Lord. And so that's the part where I would, um, I feel like that's where people want to have, I don't want to call it their cake and eat it too, because that sounds too trite. But um, they want to... I don't want to give up my lifestyle, but I want the joy of Jesus. And there is everybody has to repent from something. And so that might be the the, the gift opportunity that God has given you to repent from a same sex attraction or lifestyle. Thoughts on that, Jessa? Mm, <laughs> no. <laughs> no. I mean, we like you said, I mean, it's not a we, we don't push people away yeah. at Wells Branch because yeah. of and we have that, several yeah. people that are lesbian or, or gay at our, or gosh, that's a, oh. hey, same sex attracted or, or someone would say I'm a lesbian and I'm living out my lesbian lifestyle and I do not withhold love from them because I'm not asking them to, I want them to hear the message. of Jesus. Now, Don't we also have a lot of people in our congregation that are believers that have sin struggles that yes. we're trying to call them out of? Right. So it, it's like any other thing. Um, people, so there was a church in Austin that recently became full on gay affirming, um, I'll call it out. Restore Austin became full on gay affirming after years of being vague on it. And I was really sort of like, uh, it made me sad. And they, they sort of gave up on the authority of scripture and, all, and they gave up a lot of things. And they came from a, a Bible believing background and just the, and the, the pastor had a lot of love for people. And then he, but his love for people then changed his theology. Yeah. I- I have a lot of love for people too, and, I, and you do, you guys both do too, but I'm pretty sure we might all agree that sometimes the most loving thing you can do for somebody is show them what's – not lie to them, you know, yeah. and to call out truth and mm-hmm. show them what God wants and what's best for them. Sure, and I, and I think – What his word gosh, says. That's, it's so heartbreaking to see when you, you see then people saying, well, God's word, it's – you know, you got to take the culture – and read the Bible through the, the current culture's lens. And that's such a weird thing. This is an ancient text. And if God inspired this text, then it should be good for all time. And I think that's what's really hard about it. Oh. So anyway, and, and, you know, we're in Austin, Texas, so it's not like um, we've never seen gay people before. And so I think that's one of the things we want to be loving and compassionate. And we love, um, we love the, the gay community because God has called us to love. Um, and I'm not afraid of your sin as I'm not afraid of anyone else's sin. And I know, but I think it's offensive when I call it sin. Cause you're like, that's natural for me. And I get it. <clears throat> so I know I'm in, I know I'm intentionally offending you because the gospel offends everybody somewhere. Because if you don't know what Jesus died for, then you can't understand him as your savior. Mm-hmm. All right. <laughs> that's not the last one. Is no, it? That, that we're not ending on that. Okay. Here's another question. Um, I want to start with uh, Joseph on this one. What does it mean to be fully known <clears throat> in your marriage? And at what point should be fully known begin? What does it mean to be fully known in your virgin? And at what point should fully known begin? In your in your what? In your marriage. <laughs> what does it mean to be fully known in your marriage? And at what point should that fully known part begin? Fully known. Yeah, I said virgin. I was, you did it, say that. Yeah. Oh, did I? Oh, that's the next question. Sorry. I, I was <laughs> like, fully known. Sorry. Clear that up. Okay. Oh, that was really weird. Uh, yeah. Okay. The, so what does it mean to be fully known in, in your my, marriage? In my did I marriage. say in your virgin? What is it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, if we had some better uh, time... We put, edit that in post, but we don't. All right. So the next question is: Was it was it important that Jesus was born a virgin? I just oh okay. Sorry. What does it mean to be fully, fully known, known in your, your marriage? Yes. And at what point should be fully known begin? There we go. Uh, I don't know that you're ever fully known in your marriage. 
We're both growing constantly, changing constantly. Like to me, if, if you get to a place where you're fully known, that means you have a perfect marriage and you're not arguing, you're not fighting, you're not having those disagreements. Cause I knew it. I was like, I thought I knew this, but apparently, you know, it's not, you're not like that anymore or mm. you don't prefer, you, that's not your preference. So I, I don't know that I, that there's ever really, it's, it's ever complete. I okay. think that in a relationship, in a marriage that you're constantly processing, this is why communication is important. Marriage maintenance, I think we talked about yeah, some, some some episodes ago, but marriage maintenance is important and, and having intentional time uh, where you're having conversations with each other about life. Hey, how are you doing? How do you feel about this? And asking those hard questions that men need to come up in, in, in a marriage, talking about the things that you're not taught to talk about. So, hey, we have conversations about sex in our marriage. Hey, we have conversations about finances nice. in our marriage. Like, like those are things that need to happen on purpose. Mm -hmm. It's not just when they come up. No, let's make some intentional time uh every friday for a couple of hours or whatever go through the budget go through hey how 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 do you feel I, about like i'm just doing some of the hot, hotter topics but how do you feel about like sex am i are we having sex enough in the marriage are we not having sex what is what is enough for you like right. asking those type of questions because for a woman and a male it may be different for a woman it may be you know two times a month for a man it's like that's a day you know <laughs> and so it's just different and and when you have those hard conversations and and you do them from the beginning you take something when it's small you don't have to worry about it ever getting big and i know that's kind of one of the philosophies you talk about often chris where it's just like hey let's let's handle it when it's small yeah. so it never gets to that that big stage so I, I don't think there's ever ever a fully knowing that person you just the relationship becomes now you can cultivate it so much so that it becomes uh healthier it's where you can have yeah. hard conversations you can get through them easier and more efficient you understand hey we're on the same team so what does it look like to compromise or get through and talk about this like you get to to me you can get to where you're in alignment quicker yeah but i don't think there's ever a so, fully known <clears throat> what i love about this and i think where the person may have been coming from is, is we preach this about being fully known coming from genesis 2 25 and the man and his wife were both naked and mm. were oh, no, not yep. ashamed and so positional, I, th I think this is important. Positionally, uh, you are one with your spouse, positionally. Positionally. Now, reality, uh, and this is true when you become a Christian, like you are justified before God, 100%. God sees Jesus, loves you like he loves Jesus um, when he sees you. But your ability to love God comes through the sanctification process where you're you're looking to fully be where you are positionally in the reality of your relationship with God. And that's true, I think, also of marriage, mm -hmm. uh, that you might be positionally one, but it takes a while, as Joseph was saying, to get there. What do you, what do you think, Leah, when you, when you hear all that, just in your marriage, positionally you're one, but then the sanctification process gets you there sometimes faster and sometimes bumpier. Yeah, when you started talking, I was thinking, well, I mean, we don't even fully know Jesus. Right. Yeah, like, like life is a long journey of getting to know him and becoming more like him mm -hmm. so marriage seems yeah it's similar a reflection to of me. that right i will say though i talked about my grandpa dying and i was talking to my grandma uh, a couple days after he died and she was just telling me she's like i'm just lonely and i'm like yeah of course you're lonely and she's like no you don't get it like we were one and like half of me is gone and i'm like oh yeah i mean that's like a lifetime of love and marriage and and now she's walking through missing a big half of that. And I was like, that's that's goals, man. Hashtag relationship goals. Wow. I was like, nice. Whew. That's just so cool. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah. I, I, and so Did you answer the question? No, she didn't. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Joseph. <laughs> what? Back, back to the question. Did you, that I was, was really like, a great story. Now answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. <laughs> I, um, you guys stole everything I was thinking. So, <laughs> I didn't want to just repeat what you said, which I did repeat what you said, and then added a nice story to tie it all up in a bow. You know, well, that was a good bow. Yeah, because uh, I, I do think there <sighs> intimacy comes through time, experience, and you can't microwave it. Uh, although positionally, I just yeah, we are gonna probably men are microwaves and women are slow cookers. Something like that, yeah. <laughs> That's exactly true for sex, but it's also true for like uh, oh you know God. all things. Like I don't, I know exactly where you're going with that. It's kind of great. It's like so cliche. Yeah, it is, but it's true. Um, and I think that that I think and I think what women want. How about this? On the flip side, women want to microwave mm. the relationship aspect, and guys are like, 
I didn't know there was anything wrong, you know? <laughs> I think it's dangerous to start painting with broad brush strokes like that Fair when it comes to it gender roles. <laughs> sure, sure, I'm sure. Just yeah. gonna throw that out there. Throwing it out there. I like, like how she said that, to start painting with broad strokes like that. Yeah, I'm gonna good. have to use that. Yeah. It's a good one. It's a good one. Yeah, go to the well. Or Especially nice, you have an nice, artist for a wife. Yeah, it's a nice way to put it. <laughs> <laughs> Chris. All right, okay, now, here we go, last question. Why is it important that Jesus was born a virgin? Hmm. Leah, what do you think? I think, I mean, because he's fully God and fully man. And so if he had been born of a man and a woman, he would have been fully man, mm -hmm. not fully God. So he had to be supernaturally Okay, so let's go for to God that. to be his father. Let's, let's talk about that. Why is it important? Just for, why does it matter that God, that God Jesus is 100% man? It was really cool. And um, when I did the Treehouse Kids, uh, uh, one of the girls, I think it's a uh, Brenly, goes, uh, well, there's one man that never sinned. It was Jesus. And everyone's like, well, that's Jesus. He's God. And she said, no, he was 100% man and 100% God. <laughs> she's and I was like, she's whoa, right. Christology. Ba -ba 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 -ba. Somebody's been learning her catechism. Yeah, I was blown away by that. I was like, way that's, that's to awesome. go. <laughs> it was really, anyway, but to the point, um, why is our salvation dependent upon that? Jesus being 100% man. 100% uh, human. What do you think, Pastor Joseph? Well, he had to experience what we experience mm -hmm. as man, mm -hmm. like the temptations, yep. and they had to overcome all those things. That's right. So that's s simple. Like, I mean, keeping it simple, yep. like that part right there, he had to experience that. And the only way you do it is to be sinless. The only way you can be sinless is not to be born of Adam. Adam, mm -hmm. yeah. And so he's also called the second Adam. So. Right. Uh, although he was tempted in every way, just as Adam was tempted, uh, he overcame because he never gave in. And so his righteousness was then, and this is what God, man, the God, man imputed his righteousness to men so that we could become God, men, because now we have the Holy Spirit. Um, and so now we have our um, access to God. Mm -hmm. And so we're seen, we're justified positionally uh, and are equal to uh, or Jesus, God sees us as Jesus, as he would, so we're accepted into heaven fully. And then our ability to then live out. Um... Well, was Joseph answering this question? Sorry. I, <laughs> Keep going. Well, I, I, was I mean, if we're doing this, Leah technically still didn't answer yeah, the other right. questions. Oh, yeah. Leah, we don't go back to the other question. Of, like, it was, was good, it Chris. I'm, I'm talking about virgins now. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I think it's important to understand that our – the justification, the sanctification, and then the glorification all happens because of a God man, 100% God, 100% man, was able to make uh, his, the sinless nature of him as a human had to come because he was 100% God. And then him being 100% man made his sacrifice worthy for men. So, Did you talk about original sin and all that? I mean, if he had been born of he, man and woman, he would have had the original right, sin of Adam. Right, and that's the problem, right. Yeah, yeah he, he's the second Adam, so he's it's kind of like redo, uh, mm. Adam 2.0. Because uh, no man could have been sinless right. except Jesus. Yeah, because you had simple nature. And so you're the reason why you sin is because you're a sinner. And so Jesus never sinned because he was not a sinner. And Adam and Eve had opportunity to be not sinners. But once they sinned, you can't go back. Once you break the law in one spot, you break it in all, which is why I love that the only sin that they did was they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which was actually high treason and deserving of death. Hmm. Okay, there you go. Any other thoughts? We nope. Did a, we, we, we did a, this is an hour long podcast. I feel bad. <laughs> it was so good though. Do you come on and this is the longest podcast, podcast we have all time. I know, and they really should be shorter. So I feel <laughs> bad. <laughs> this, is, this is the podcast for the people on the long drive. So we want to thank all of you for listening. Uh, hey, if you have any questions, uh, we'll leave the the number in the the show notes, and we would love to connect with you. Make sure you subscribe on all your social media channels and uh, let us know what you think. Uh, we would love to talk faith, culture, and everything in between. Uh, but until next time, have an awesome week of worship.